Numbers chapter number 20. Have you enjoyed the snacks that Mrs. Whitworth hands out in the morning? Has, has those been enjoyable? Okay, good. And uh, now, if I can get Robert to continue to bring them on and things of that. <laughs> Numbers chapter number 20. I cannot tell you how happy I will be to be able to be back in our building, to hear everyone sing at the same time, to be able to just enjoy some fellowship. Uh, we'll still practice a, a, a portion of social distancing in that instance. So those of you that are huggers, give us a little time, all right? <laughs> but uh, in that instance, how many, how many got that message on the Facebook page that said, all right, uh, when we're allowed to undo some of this, those folks that like to hug, they said, uh, I like the last line, we're going to make it weird. <laughs> so uh, in that instance, uh, uh, that's fine with me. And so just uh, keep it appropriate, I guess, to say. Numbers chapter number 20. Numbers chapter number 20. One thing that you and I are always going to face and one thing that we're always going to run into is going to be the instance where uh, decisions are going to have to be made. The truth is you and I are going to make decisions every single day. Every single day that we make decisions could be something that's going to change our life in the long run, or it could be something as simple as uh, just uh, what direction to go to work that morning, or where to park, or who to speak with, and uh, in that instance. But I look at these decisions that sometimes are a little bit on the grander scale as a place where we come to the a point of Kadesh. Now, Kadesh is a place in Scripture that... Uh, uh, is one of those places where the children of Israel, as they were leaving Egypt, came to Kadesh Barnea. That was a place where they sent out the 12 spies and uh, to go and spy out the land to see where they should go in and where they should begin to conquer and where they should begin to make their trek into the promised land that God had promised to them. Unfortunately for the uh, children of Israel, when they came to Kadesh, you know the events that took place. They sent out the 12 spies and 10 of them came back and they formed a Baptist committee and said, we shouldn't go. And, uh, but there was two of them that still stood forth and said, you know what, I think we should go. God's already promised it to us. He's already promised that he's going to give it to us. We should go. And uh, oftentimes in our decision-making processes, we come to that place of Kadesh in our life. And uh, it, it, it's how that we should act, how that we should behave, how that we should live, how that we should think, and how that we should believe. You see, the children of Israel had already been given who to believe and put their faith in. But that began to falter a little bit. And the truth is, I, I can't blame them too much. There was uh, an interesting thing, and I began to look into that just a little bit more even at that. The, the reason why now the children of Israel, and uh, in, in a bad, broad scope of things, in hundreds of years, if you would, they, they left the promised land that God had given to them and came to Egypt to follow uh, Joseph at that time. I'm not sure that was exactly what should have been done. Scripture doesn't give us very much clarity to it other than the fact of this. There comes a point in the uh, scriptures there it says there rose up a king who knew not Joseph. Two things are involved with that. Why had they forgotten the individual that had made it such an impact that they followed God that saved Egypt and Israel of that, of that day? Why was it that, that Joseph and the God that he served was so quickly set aside and forgotten? And so in that instance, it, just the fact that statement is made, there rose up a king who knew not Joseph, reminds us that those, those victories that we win through faith, we need to remind the next generation. Those things that we uh, have enjoyed as far as the principles from Scripture that have benefited, that have been a blessing to us, that have formed a country that we have had freedom for over 200 years now, has been the fact that there has been some godly influence in that. We cannot let that go. We cannot let that set aside. We cannot let those things go because if we do, there will rise up a, a generation that doesn't know the same God that you and I knew. They, they have heard about God and they heard about Jesus, but they don't know who he is. They've never had the prayers answered. They've never had scriptures put in place that, uh, that have uh, constituted how they're going to live and how they're going to form their belief patterns and, and uh, how they're going to pro, uh, be a productive citizen. And in that instance, if we're not careful, they'll rise up a generation, even for us, that doesn't know the same God that you and I know and that doesn't know the same scripture that you and I know. But there's always that time that that decision-making process is brought before us. That is that place of Kadesh. And so I want to talk to you this morning just a little bit about Kadesh because in that instance, Satan always wants to infiltrate that because he knows that we have to make decisions. He knows that. And since that's the case, God has already given us principles and instructed and given us some direction. I'll give you four this morning that will help us a little bit in our decision-making processes. So when we come to that point of Kadesh, that we don't falter too badly. But I want you to notice that what happens when you do come to that point where you're making life-changing 
decisions where you're going to live who you're going to listen to who's going to make an impact and an influence in your life I want you to notice one of the very first things that comes into play and uh, let me let me give just a little bit more uh, uh, introduction to what we're going to talk about this morning often bef before we decide on a matter whether it's life-changing or simple someone or something steps in to cloud our decision-making process and in the process of clouding that sometimes we cannot see as clearly as we'd like to see just the other evening I uh, they had uh, they have installed uh, some new lighting in uh, in the place where I uh, oftentimes uh, at well at the terminal that is there the new lighting is very intense and uh, and they've they've placed it on top of the building which is not a problem it lets everybody see what's going on uh, around there but uh, when you begin to uh, back up towards uh, the building all of a sudden that light is sometimes in your eyes in your mirrors and things of that nature and that even though as long as the mirror is clean it's not a problem but if the lightest little bit of dirt and dust get on that all of a sudden that light hits it and you cannot see is the is the glass clean clear yes the glass is clear is the light intense yes it is the problem's not with the light and the problem's not with the glass the problem's with the fact that I haven't gotten it cleaned so as soon as I clean it all of a sudden it doesn't glare any longer and I can see clearly and I can easily do what needs to be done it reminds us of this that oftentimes Satan comes and is our is our ability to see the Lord's working clear yes it is is he lights it so that he broadcasts what is true yes it is the problem is we let the uh, the dust of this world sometimes get on us. you ever notice when even in the New Testament when uh, Jesus was washing the disciples feet and uh, Peter was looking at it as a, a servitude type thing and the Lord Jesus was showing yes a servant is greatest of all and Jesus did come to serve in that particular instance and and as uh, as Peter was sitting there he said Lord you're not washing my feet see the purpose in washing their feet was this to get that dirt off to to take the remnants of the world away and that was a picture behind the whole thing in that instance Peter Peter said you're not gonna wash the dirt off me Lord uh, you're not gonna be my servant and the Lord said if I don't wash your feet you have no part with me and then of course Peter said oh, okay then wash me all over then <laughs> he said you don't need to be washed all over you just need to get the dirt and things cleared off every now and again God reminds us of this very principle he says you're saved you don't have to constantly be getting saved over and over again he says but the thing that you and I do need to do is we need to get the the dirt of this world washed off of us on occasion and so in that instance there is a, a process for that scripture reminds us by the washing of the water of the word and so you take in the Word of God to clean our hearts and to clean our vision so that we can see clearly and so in that instance there's somebody that comes in our decision-making process to cloud that judgment and to cloud that process and I want you to notice there's two things uh, initially that we need to be cautioned about uh, in, in, in other words when we begin to make these decisions there's no time to decide you say I have to make a decision quickly well if you have to make a decision quickly oftentimes uh, no I'm not gonna make the decision you you've got them phone calls you you've been involved with the individual that's trying to sell you something whether it's a car or a timeshare or anything else they say, oh, I can't give you this deal tomorrow well then walk away and so oh, you got you got to decide now you have to sign on the dotted line now uh, this may not be available tomorrow say okay I'll take I'll take my chances then it's like well no 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 or are the are, are this one well I I know the, the the boss doesn't know this but I'm giving you this special deal that I'm giving to no one else if you'll sign right now well if you don't have time to think and pray about a decision in that particular instance it's going to be a larger uh, whether it's a, a, a large decision to purchase something along those lines just say no nah, that's all right the uh, young people one day in school uh, I was the administrator and principal of the school I taught my classes I was in my office and uh, they had gotten caught up with everything that day and uh, they came in and uh, a number they came knocking on my door and they were knocking and knocking so I opened the door and said what they said uh, uh, they said mr. Whitworth we're, we're all caught up we've gotten all of our goals done we've gotten everything accomplished we've gotten everything done can can we go get ice cream and uh, and so uh, they knew I I like ice cream the other day uh, miss candy sent me a picture of a peanut butter buster parfait that's evil you know when you can't get out and go get one immediately it's evil to send somebody a picture of that <laughs> and so but uh, the kids were can we go get ice cream and I, I'm interested in buying them ice cream and uh, but I had I didn't know what the rest of the daily schedule was I hadn't checked with the teachers and things of that nature 
And, uh, and I asked them, I said, well, give me a little bit of time and, uh, and I'll let you know. And they said, no, we want to know right now. We want to plan. We want to make. I said, you need to know right this minute. And at three or four of them, yes, we need to know right now. They thought it was a little bit on the comical side. I said, then no. They said, what? I said, no. I don't have time to think about it. I don't have time to consider it. So the answer is no. And they said, okay, well, take your time. I said, it's too late now. I've already decided. And uh, they said, like, oh, are you serious? I said, I'm absolutely serious. If you don't want me to take time to think about it and decide, uh, they, then the answer is no. And they said, oh. I said, go back to class. They went back to class. They were a little despondent and things of that nature. Well, a, a week or so later, they got caught up with their goals again, and they got caught up. And uh, so they came knocking on my door again. Mr. Whitworth, Mr. Whitworth. And I said, I opened the door. What's going on? They said, we're all caught up with everything. We're caught up with our goals. And would you, would you consider taking us to get ice cream? And I said, do you need a decision right away? And three or four of them said, no, no, no. But there was one little girl named Tara. Yes, tell us right now. And they grabbed her and they held her mouth. And they said, no, no, you take all the time you want. And so I checked with a few of the teachers. They said, yeah, we've got everything caught up. We don't have anything going. I said, good. I said, okay. So I went back to the crew, and I said, all right, let's go load up. Let's go get on the bus. We'll go over, and we'll go to the get ice cream. But they learned a lesson, same lesson that you and I need to know. If you've got to make a decision right this minute, sometimes the safest uh, answer is no. That's a caution thing. And, uh, and so, number one, be careful about making decisions on the spot immediately because sometimes Satan's in that because he tries to point you in the direction. Keep in mind, number two, allow principle to make your decision. Now, we'll talk about some more things here in a little bit, but allow principle to make your decision, those two things quickly. The best way to decide is before trouble hits. The best way to decide about something is before trouble comes your way. Solve a problem before it's a problem. That's the, usually the best way to solve one. So let me give you just, if I could, a few things from Scripture that is here, some, effect, uh, some effects to cloud our judgment. And, uh, and God shows us these lessons here even in Scripture. So let me take a, just a moment, if I could, and go through them quickly. Make sure that you give me time over here because I haven't looked at my watch, so you're going to have to make sure to, to keep me on, on spot here. So the decision must come. Who will influence our decision? I want you to notice the very first thing when we come to uh, Numbers, chapter number 20. First thing sometimes that comes our direction when we're making a decision or when we've got to make a decision, notice what takes place here even with the children of Israel. They were needing to make a decision. Do we go into the promised land? Notice the very first thing that shows up. Verse number 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam, this is Moses' sister, the very one that went and got uh, the help when Moses was uh, there in the little bulrushes. And when Pharaoh's daughter found him, and uh, all the, the circumstances that surrounded him, I'm not going to get into all the, the things that it surrounded him, but Moses was put in the, in the river in the bulrushes to spare his life. Mary and his sister was watching what was going on, and when the princess came down uh, to, to bathe that day, all of a sudden she heard some crying going on, and Moses, the little baby, was crying over in the bulrushes. The attendants went and got him and brought him back, and she opened it up, and she looked down and saw this little Hebrew boy and said, uh, you know, I need somebody to care for him. Miriam said, I know somebody, and went and got her mother. Moses, for the most part, was taken care of by his own mother. So Miriam now has been with Moses through Egypt, has left Egypt and now coming up to the brink of Kadesh, making decisions. Do we go in now? And I want you to notice, it says here, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Sometimes the very first thing that shows up when you're making a decision is something, I put it here, death. Something that has an emotional struggle in your own heart and life. That emotional struggle shows up and all of a sudden it's not, do I, uh, in other words, we begin to, ask, we begin to question this. But we're following God's plan. The children of Israel were following exactly what God had instructed them to do. Exactly what God had instructed them to do, and all of a sudden, death showed up. Don't be surprised when emotional struggles show up in the midst of you making a right decision or a wrong decision. Because God knows very clearly, and so does Satan, that our emotions sometimes will point us in a direction that we should not go. And because of that, uh, if our decision maker is not in good shape, that will oftentimes do something off the cuff or do something that we shouldn't do. Because our emotions sometimes play with our, our decision-making process. Brother Howes used to teach a lesson, don't make a decision when your decision-maker is broken. And emotions oftentimes is that struggle that we have. It comes time to make a decision because our emotions are connected with And our emotions get intact, and we begin to look at it sometimes with that 
clouded judgment. Satan knows that, and so he'll allow something like that to show up. He'll, he'll, he'll try to promote it. He'll try to uh, create it bigger than what it should be. So the first cloud that shows up in your life is that of death, some difficulty along those lines that connects with your emotions. We had a friend that we went to uh, school with, Virginia Harris. Virginia is, uh, was going as uh, she had gotten married, and she was going to go to the mission field. They were on deputation, and as they were traveling, their car broke down. I think it's kind of funny because many people uh, would confuse Mrs. Whitworth with Virginia, but Virginia looks nothing like Marlena, nothing. They say she does. Virginia's not half as pretty as she is. And so uh, in that instance, uh, that's, uh, that's my opinion, <laughs> and I don't care about yours. And so, uh, but, uh, but Virginia and her husband were getting ready to go to the mission field. They had uh, gotten a flat tire, and they pulled over on the side of the road, and as they were preparing a a driver came by and uh, whether there was whether I, and I, I'm not sure if I can remember the story clearly I can I can get it clear but 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 at some point or another didn't see them or or was drunken or something or another but ran into Virginia there as she was on the side of the road uh, trying to help her husband get the tire changed well now they're on their way to the mission field now difficulties have just set in Virginia lost a good portion of her leg that day and they had to amputate it and so she now is, uh, she has a, uh, you know, a, a prosthetic, still went to the mission field, still went to she, what she was, uh, to do what she was supposed to do. But in that instance, when in the process, now all of a sudden, this cloud of judgment shows up. God, we're doing your will. How come all of a sudden now this major struggle is here? Maybe you don't want us to go. Maybe it's going to be more difficult than what we expected. Now there's going to be obstacles to go overcome that we never anticipated. Yeah, sometimes that emotional struggle will show up when you're making a decision. I think of a young man named Ezekiel Pohazi. Ezekiel was in Bible college studying to go into the ministry. Ezekiel was in my uh, fifth and sixth grade classes when I was teaching uh, classes there in Bern, Indiana. Ezekiel was a riot. He is the one that helped me create a number of things that we used in the ministry for the rest of our lives. Uh, Ezekiel was one of the first ones that I began to, uh, <laughs> I ask him. Now, how many understand I like coffee? Toot your horn if you understand that very clear. Oh, yeah, I like it. Just the other day, Brother Jimmy Singleton sent me a whole box full of coffee just the other day. And uh, I enjoy it. I do. And so uh, teaching school, what do you do? You drink coffee, and then the kids are in there and things of that nature. And, uh, and you, you, you keep that nice coffee breath for a reason. I could put a Tic Tac in my mouth. I could have gotten an Altoid. I could have got some of those things. But you understand that when you're teaching those, fourth, those fifth and sixth graders, you you, you allow them to learn a lesson very quickly. Ezekiel was misbehaving in things of that nature, just as uh, kids do. Now, now, brilliant kids, they honestly were. And, uh, but I got right up there, and I said, Zeke, do you need my attention? And he's kind of chuckling and laughing. He would always take his one finger and put it up to his lips, and he'd move his eyes back and forth. He said, well, I'd, I'm not sure that I do. And uh, so I, I'd get right nose to nose with Zeke. And, of course, that coffee breath is just wafting out there as I'm talking. I said, Zeke, you've got my full attention now. Do you need my attention? You've got it. Nobody else in this whole classroom has my attention like you. And I'm nose to nose with him. And he's going, Mr. Whitworth, no, I think everything's all right. Of course, the rest of the kids loved it, loved it. And in that instance, so any time then afterwards, I would just simply, Zeke would be misbehaving. I said, Zeke, do you need my full attention? And they'd all go, yeah, give him your full attention. Yeah, give him your... And he's like, no, no, sir. No, sir, I'm paying attention. I'm... We learn a lesson. Zeke was there in Bible school. He was on his way home from work one night, fell asleep, ran into, uh, just uh, had a car accident, killed him and went to be in glory. Just as a young man, getting ready to start his ministry, his family would have thought, what, what are we doing serving God? What are we doing trying to do right? Why are, uh, you know, our son was in the ministry, and now he is no longer able to do what needs to be done. God took him from us. You think that's something? Their second son, Elisha, was on their way home from Bible school, had been married just a short period of time, and uh, had, was, bringing, was coming home to tell the parents that uh, they were going to be grandparents. And so in that instance, Elisha, his younger brother, was coming home right up here on Highway 30, our accident sent all three of them to glory. Mr. and Mrs. Pohazi, what do you feel about that? We still love God. We still know he's in control. Sometimes that emotional draw will come to you. 
I remember both them young men. I'll see them again when we get in heaven. In that instance, sometimes that struggle will show up for you and I when we're in the midst of making decisions. Kadesh, that place. Not only was death a, an emotional struggle that is there, I want you to notice the sec th second thing that is here. In verse number 1, Then came the children of Israel into the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. Sometimes that second cloud that shows up in your life and mind when we're making decisions there at Kadesh is that desert place, that desert place. In other words, a physical struggle. There's not enough. There's not enough. And we look at the circumstances that are there. The, the truth is, the children of Israel, as we begin to read on, look at verse number 2 if you have your Bibles there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people uh, chowed with Moses and spake, uh, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in? unto this evil place. It is, uh, it is no place of seed or a fig or a vine or of pomegranate, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their face, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. That second cloud that will show up in the midst of our Kadesh decisions is a desert place. There's just not enough. I'm doing what God has asked me to do. I'm doing what I believe the Lord has instructed me to do, but it just doesn't seem like there's going to be enough. That's not a new struggle. It's not a new cloud that clouds our judgment because Satan has used it many times. I'll, I'll hasten here and, and move on just a little bit further. I want you to notice, if you would please, you're right there in, in Numbers chapter number 20. Look, if you would please, in, in verse number 14. Let me read a few verses here. Because the third cloud that shows up is no assistance. You seem to be on your own. On your own, there's no one there. Notice, if you would, please, in, in verse number 14. The Bible says, And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother in Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time. And the Egypt, Egyptians have vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice, and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the utmost part of the borders. Let us uh, pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields, nor through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by King's, way, uh, King's Highway. We will not turn to the right hand or the left until we have passed thy borders. Notice verse number 18. He already said, look, we're your brethren. It, we're, we're connected. It, it, the family, we're connected. We, we, and notice, he said, just give us a little assistance. Let us pass by. We won't steal from you. We won't take your provisions. We won't drink up your water. We won't do any of that. We'll, we'll go up and we'll just come around. Notice verse number 18. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. No assistance. Sometimes that third cloud that shows up in your life and mine in the midst of making decisions in Kadesh, there's just no assistance. It seems like you're all alone. And in that instance, you begin to think, Am I really supposed to do this? I, I, emotionally, I'm struggling. Physically, I, there's not enough. And now, if you would, from, are, from, are those that should be helping at this time, I can get no assistance. It just seems like I'm on my own. Yeah, see, Satan wants you to believe that, too. Not only that, the fourth one that is here, not only is that a, a problem, you have no assistance that is there. And the truth is, Moses even asked again in verse number 19, the children of Israel said unto him, we'll go by the highway, and if I or my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Moses now is somewhat in the middle of the children of Israel making a decision. Should we go? What should we do? Well, there's now a uh, an emotional struggle, death. There's a physical struggle. There's not enough. There's the, the struggle that comes with no assistance. But look at the last one that even shows up. Numbers chapter number 20 and verse number 23. Sometimes the family issues show up too. Notice what takes place in verse number 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount, in Mount Hor. Now, Aaron was Moses' brother. God had already instructed, we'll send Aaron with you to be the spokesperson and the high priest. And notice in verse number 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. In other words, he's going to die. For he shall not enter into the land which, which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. So now there's a, 
family issue that showed up. Now there's difficulties that even come from a very familiar place. Now these things are clouding all the judgment of the children of Israel. What should we do? Should we go into the land? Should we follow the, the principles that we know to be right? What do we do? We see these things that Satan is going to bring. And by the way, he'll bring them into your life too. You're making a decision at some point, whether it's to how you're going to rear your children, where you're going to live, what job you're going to have, where you're going to go, just certain decisions that come in your heart and life. All of us face them at different times or another. And Satan knows that if he can begin to throw these things at you, that you'll oftentimes make a decision that it'll be very difficult to recover. That's exactly what happened to the children of Israel. They determined, we won't go into the promised land. We won't go in, and so we'll stay on this side. And we'll, uh, we'll wander in the wilderness now for 40 years. That was not what God had intended for them. It is not what God had given to them already. See, that's the thing. God has promised us provision. He's promised us the promised land. As Caleb and, and Joshua came back and said, let's go. We're well able to do that. And so in that instance, they came and said, we can take it because it doesn't matter how many we have. It doesn't matter whether who agrees to it. It doesn't matter whether we think the provisions are not enough. God has already said he's going to take care of us, and God's big enough to do what needs to be done. And by the way, he's big enough to do what needs to be done for you too. Let me give you four things, if I could, just very quickly to help keep those clo these clouded judgments from coming your direction because they will come. I'm telling you right now they'll show up. I'm telling you right now, they'll show up, and you'll think, oh, nope, this is a bad plan. I know I was trying to do what God wanted me to do, but clearly, uh, there's too much opposition. There's going to be opposition when you do right. I'm telling you right now, for an absolute, dead-level fact, opposition will come your way when you begin to do right. When you determine, you know what, I'm going to hand out a gospel tract today, you can guarantee opposition is going to show up right in your face. I guarantee it, the second that you begin to try to work towards doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ, that opposition is going to show up, whether it's, whether, it's a, a, whether it's a physical struggle or an emotional struggle or whether there's no assistance that seems to be there, or whether it's a family issue that shows up. I promise you it's going to show up. I'm telling you right now it will. Now call me, and you say, Brother Whitworth, I, I need some help, and I'll, I'll say, Let, let's get through this. God's bigger than all these things, and he is. And so in that instance, let me give you these four things, and I'll hasten through them. Number one, affirm your faith in God. Affirm your faith in God. And uh, if, if, I, if nothing else comes across today, you need to understand this. Affirm your faith in God. You got your Bibles open there to Numbers? Look at chapter number 23, if you would. Chapter number 23. Notice the very first verses that are there. Now, Moses has to deal with all the circumstances that have just come his way. He's got to deal with all the things that he has seen. Notice in uh, chapter number 23. Oop. Make sure that, I, sure that I, I'm sorry. Chapter number 21. I'm sorry. Chapter number 21. The Bible says, And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that, the, that Israel came by the way of the, the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. Notice verse number 2. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord. What did they do? They reaffirmed their faith in God. Notice what they said. And said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Lo, notice verse number 3. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. I like to think of that. It's a, uh, we can call it Hormel. It's a place where good chili and, uh, and uh, macaroni and cheese come together to make that wonderful chili mac. But uh, in that instance, we see here, affirm your faith in God. Affirm your faith in God. That's exactly what Moses did. Number two, principle your life to align with God's word principle your life to align with God's word. If, God word is, if God's word has said it, align yourself in accordance to that. Here, here's a very simple one. <coughs> David gave it to us in the, very beginning, walk, in the very beginning of Psalms. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. He's making it very clear that that's an instance where we better make sure that we find godly counsel when we're in our decision-making processes. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So number two, principle your life to align with God's word. Number three, adversity must not falter your faith. Adversity must not falter your faith. In other words, realize adversity is going to come. doesn't make me a difference. God's bigger than that. Then number four, tell God and others he is still on the throne of your life. Tell God and others, because you need to hear it yourself. And others need to know that, well, when everything goes wrong, what do you do? I still have faith in God. When everything falls apart, what are you going to do? Still have faith in God. 
when it seems like everybody's against you and everything's against you, I still have faith in God. doesn't mean it's easy. Sometimes you may see it as the tears course down your cheeks. But the truth is, God's still faithful. He's still real. He'll, stay, he'll still take care of you. Number one, affirm your faith in God. Number two, principle your life to align with God's word. Number three, adversity must not falter your faith and tell God and others he is still on the throne of your life. I promise you when you realize that God's with you, nothing else will matter. I promise you when you realize that God knows what's going on in your heart and life and the circumstances that you're in, nothing else will matter. Does it make things easy? Not always, but this is what it will do. It will affirm that faith in God and he'll bring a peace and victory that you can get nowhere else. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I do ask now this morning that you help us to realize the impact that your word can have on our life. I ask that you'd please help our dear people now as we face circumstances. Lord, there's uh, voices all over the place that are telling us what we're supposed to believe. And Lord, there are instances where folks are telling us how that those things that we have put our faith and trust in before, whether it's the constitution of our Nathan, nation or our faith in God, is no longer in effect. And God, I do ask that you'd please help us now to stand strong and stalwart for thy will. I ask, Lord, of course, that you'd please just bless our dear folks. Help us now to walk according to your will. We need your help. Lord, I do ask now that you'd please keep folks safe, healthy, and on, your, uh, on track for you. We ask now, of course, for your help today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're glad Jesus is on the throne of, li of your life, would you please honk your horn? tell you i wish i had a horn to toot right now i'm telling you for a fact but uh i'm grateful that you're here i'm grateful that you've come uh wednesday there will be a, a broadcast as we normally have but next sunday we will meet in the building we're go we will spread out things a little bit once again i will uh i'll mention to you no one is required to come by any stretch of the imagination i want to see you but we will we will practice a good portion of social distancing we'll make sure that things are cleaned if you want to wear a mask it will not hurt my feelings in the least bit and uh, I just want you to come and feel like uh, you can be a part if that's the case. But uh, in that instance, I want you to be safe. If you don't feel that's a good plan for you, then don't. And, uh, but in that instance, we are, going to, uh, we are going to make sure that we try to meet in the building uh, next Sunday. Next Sunday. So please keep that in mind, if you would, please. And that uh, normal time. Normal time. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's do it like this as we just begin. Uh, church normally begins at 1030. And, uh, and that's what we'll do. We'll have one service. We won't have Sunday school initially. All right, so it'll be one service, 1030, just as normal. And, uh, and we'll make those plans for next Sunday, all right? Mothers, I know that uh, I look forward to uh, being able to uh, not only recognize all of our mothers, and, uh, but also I have gifts for them. And so please keep that in mind if you would, please. Wonderful. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a note, or if you have something that needs, uh, needs some attention and you want to leave me a note, uh, as the folks are towards the uh, uh, back back there, if you want to drop that in there, uh, we will continue to use some of the uh, text messaging. Have, has, have those worked nicely? Have they worked all right? Good. I, it, it makes it a little easier to quickly make one statement and get it to everybody quickly. And so uh, we'll, we'll continue to use that on occasion. Uh, we won't overwork it. I'm not going to send you something every single day. Uh, but in that instance, if it can be a help, we want it to be a help. Uh, along those lines there. So keep those things in mind if you would. Lord bless you. Have a great day. And uh, we look forward to seeing folks next Sunday. Kevin, Brother Kevin, will, let me make sure this is... I know. I, oh, that's it? Okay, Brother Kevin will help you all be dismissed at this time. He'll kind of help you make your way out. I could leave it on so you could hear me as I'm talking everywhere else. And that's, that's always interesting, isn't it? <laughs>